Well, happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Um, we love you. We're so grateful for you. Hope you enjoyed that. I love the Target and the garbage. You know, we have a line item in our budget just called Target. It's just Target. It's all the things, all the throw pillows, everything in Target. It's just like the promised land for my wife. But I do want to honor uh, my mom. Mom, you'll probably be watching this on Monday or Tuesday, as she does every single week. I love you. I'm grateful for you. Um, and also my wife. I couldn't ask for a more incredible wife for my kids. My wife's in the foyer. Hi, love. All right. Well, today we are continuing in our teaching series, The War Within. And what we're doing in the series is we're looking at aspects of our internal lived experience that are an uphill battle and are really hard to change for the better in. Now, up till this point, we've looked at pretty concrete concepts, you know, words, thoughts. It's hard to call emotions concrete, but we can easily recognize an emotional struggle. Today, we're kind of going into the abstract, and we're going to be looking at the topic of identity. Identity. And though it's a little bit abstract, I think it is one of the most important battlefronts to understand in your life. So join me in the book of Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And we're going to begin in verse 18 and read through verse 21. So Galatians 2 verse 18 through 21. Follow along in your Bible or in a Bible app. If you're reading in a Bible app, I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. So if you select that translation, you'll be able to follow along word for word. You're also welcome to follow along up here on the screen. So I'm going to read, then I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to dive into the topic of identity and what it looks like to win that war. Galatians 2 verse 18. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. This is the word of the Lord. Join me and let's pray and ask that he would guide us in it today. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the identity that we can have by putting our faith in the gospel, that we can look to Christ and find out who we are. But Lord, my prayer is that you would open our eyes to the tactic of our enemy to shift that, to try and get us off track, that we might fight the good fight of faith, as, as the scriptures say. So would you lead and guide us in your word, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So here's a question. How does a salesperson sell you something you already have? You already have this thing, but a salesperson comes up and they want you to buy what they're selling, but you already have one. Well, the answer is simple. You convince, you know, that person has to convince you that what you have is insufficient. And you're thinking like, what kind of dimwit buys something they already have? Um, you know the Apple iPhone upgrade program? <laughs> Apple is convincing you to, that what you have is insufficient. Now, I have that on my mind because I'm working off an iPhone 8, and it is slowly but surely dying. Um, but yeah, they, a salesperson needs to create a dissatisfaction with the thing that you already have and convince you that you need something new. You need to upgrade. Now, the reason I kind of bring that example to our attention is because that's a lot like the demonic tactic when it comes to a person's identity. Back back in the very first example of a demonic tactic in the Bible, maybe you are familiar with the story, Satan takes on the form of a serpent and comes to our first mother and convinces her to eat a piece of fruit, the only prohibition that God had given our first parents. But the words are very telling. What does the serpent say? 
when you eat of this fruit, you will become like God, knowing good and evil. Here's the really tragic thing about that story. They were already like God. They were made in God's image. Imagers of God. A full, whole, integrous identity that didn't need to be supplemented or shifted or changed or, you know, um, have any, like, additions to it. But the demonic tactic was to convince our first parents that it was insufficient. And that demonic tactic has been at work ever since. Paul says that the Galatians are actually falling into that trap. He uses this language to describe what they're doing. He says, if I rebuild what I tore down, I'm made a transgressor. Now, in the case of the Galatians, what they're doing is they have begun to believe the lie that they needed law obedience in order to have a fully formed identity for God and in order to to glorify God. So, although they had started well, their identity fully grounded in Christ, they had begun to buy this deceptive tactic that they now needed to observe rituals and circumcision and all of these additions to their identity in order for God to give them his stamp of approval. So what Paul does is he tries to open their eyes to to that demonic tactic and he exemplifies what it means to ground your identity in Christ. And here's what his words tell us. That winning the war for your identity means refusing to rebuild a self-made you, that's the first part, and trusting that the life you have in Jesus is enough. Winning the war for your identity means refusing to rebuild a self-made you and trusting that the life you have in Jesus is enough. So we must ask and answer the question, what is an identity and how is it formed? So simply put, an identity is a group of characteristics that makes you identifiable. Said another way, it is the grouping of things that you point to, to be able to answer the question, who am I? Now there are typically, like, I'm, I'm sure that there are more than these, but when I was thinking about the wells we typically tap to figure out who we are, here are some that came to mind. The first one is environment. The environment that you grow up in like your family of origin, your culture, your country, your nationality, your language, your, your, your tribe, right? So for me, I could say, like, I am Justin Chapman, son of Greg Chapman and Marlene Chapman, born in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and, but not really raised there. My, my story's a mess, so I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. But the, the idea is you look at the environment that you find yourself in, and the characteristics of that in order to tell you who you are. Here's another one. Cultural pressure. Cultural pressure. Now, I don't necessarily mean cultural pressure in a bad way, because pressure isn't always a bad thing. But every person, every culture has things that they celebrate and things that they repudiate. Things that they give the thumbs up to and the things that they give the thumbs down to. And there is cultural pressure for you in your life to give your personal thumbs up to those very same things and to give your personal thumbs down to those same things. Here's a third one. Internal desires. Now, this is very prevalent in our day and age. Um, Philip Reif, who's who's, uh, a sociologist who's passed away, he kind of gives us a simple way to understand how people have formed their identities throughout the progress of, um, of uh, JP, we, we can take that slide down. I, everybody's wondering, like, what are these intersecting circles? And I'm not going to explain that for, for probably a solid eight minutes. So I don't want you to be confused for eight minutes. Um, but Philip, Philip Reef says, throughout the ages, kind of a basic way to understand how people have formed their identities is, at first we had what he calls the political man, which is the you know, this was in the times of Plato and Aristotle, where they looked to the political way of thinking and organizing in order to figure out who they were. Then that gave way to the religious man in the Middle Ages, that a person's religious observations formed their identity. That gave way to the economic man during the time of the Industrial Revolution, and now it was about 
I figure out who I am by what I can produce. But then that gave way in the 20th century to the, what, what he calls the psychological man, which is looking at the inward experience in order to figure out who you are. Now, that's a bit of an oversimplification, but it's helpful to see how having a set of characteristics or there, there being paradigms throughout the ages help people figure out who they are. Now, when it comes to internal desires, that is very much of this psychological nature where you look inward at your, what you feel and desire on the inside in order to, to form your identity. Here's a fourth one that's also very prevalent. What I do. This is similar to the economic man, but it's a little more broad because it's not necessarily economic. It's saying, look, whatever I do, that forms the basis for who I am. Whether that's working for a specific company, whether that's being a mom or a dad or a friend or a part of a very strong family culture. I guess that's more environment than what I do. Um, but the idea is my accomplishments, what I'm able to attain, that defines who I am. Now, it's important to note that according to the Bible, none of these are bad in and of themselves. Everybody grows up in an environment, you know, a nationality, a culture, a tribe. Everybody experiences cultural pressure, and some cultural pressures are good. In every single culture, like God created people who create culture. And there are aspects of every single culture that a Christian can celebrate. Experiencing internal desires is not a bad thing. That's what the Stoics would say. That you have to reject all desire. The Bible doesn't say that. In fact, it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Nor is what I do a bad thing. That to have meaningful purpose and work and apply yourself is a really, really good thing. However, when it goes sour is when these become a basis for your identity. For a Christian... There is only one thing that they point to to figure out who they are, and that's Christ. And Paul says you must never, in his words, rebuild what you tore down. And he's referring to the fact that when you become a Christian, your very identity gets renovated such that you are planted in Christ. Jesus used these words. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Get, get kind of the picture here. When you become a Christian, you are uprooted from whatever you trusted to form your identity and you are planted, grafted into Christ. And now he is the very source of your identity. So the question then becomes, how does a Christian relate to environment, cultural pressure, internal desires, and what you do? And now we get our fun picture. So what we have here is we have the Christ sphere. And then we have the other spheres, environment, cultural pressure, internal desire, what I do. There are areas of intersection in all those things that can be celebrated, endorsed, experienced, enjoyed, and all those aspects that fall within the bounds of Christ, that honor Jesus, that align with the scriptures. God loves for us to celebrate those, to use them. But there's going to be an aspect of all these things that falls outside an identity formed in Christ. And those are to be torn down, as Paul says. So to give you an example, I say that you know, every culture has things that they celebrate and things that they give the thumbs down to. Some of those things that they celebrate, the scriptures would celebrate and Jesus would celebrate. And we are to celebrate those along with our culture as well. There are some things that a culture will celebrate that the scriptures give the thumbs down to and call sin, right? Now, what about this, you know, what I do circle? Because it's not as if some aspects of your job, you know, are within Christ and some aspects aren't. Well, maybe. If you're like money laundering, there's a pretty big portion of your job that is outside of Christ. But I know a lot of you, and for most of you, I, I'm not aware of any money laundering activities. Um, but take that sphere for example, right? 
if any thought enters into your mind, uh, you know, say you're part of a company, and the thought enters your mind of like, unless I reach C status in my company, I'm not worthwhile. Well, that is a thought and a way of thinking about your identity that is outside of Christ. A thought that goes inside of that would be like, no matter what position I have, God has given me the opportunity to serve people, to make beautiful things, to create culture, to, to, to create things that make for a better city, a better neighborhood, a better environment, a better world. That is in alignment with our identity in Christ. So this is what a Christian needs to learn to do, and it's hard. This is tough. This is quite tough. And you can also use this image to understand how you know when, let's put it this way, how do you know when you're rebuilding a self-made you? Paul says to the Galatians, you must never rebuild a self-made you. How do you know when you're doing that? I can think of three marks of rebuilding a self-made you. Here's the first one. Feelings of superiority or inferiority. All the isms, racism, classism, ethnocentrism, you know, um, all those things happen when somebody takes a good thing, you know, a, growing up in a culture or growing up in a nation, a national identity, but then elevated, you know, excuse me, elevates it to the point of being an ultimate thing and defines themselves by contrasting it to what other people have. So there's a really easy way to see this. Like if you were in, you know, if you lived in Germany in the 1930s and you went to a rally of the National Socialist German Workers Party, also known as the Nazis, there was extreme cultural pressure to give the thumbs up to things like hating communists and Jewish people. And if you buy into that feeling of superiority, national superiority, that is a sign that National identity has gone from being like a good thing. To celebrate your culture is a good thing, but it's gone to being an ultimate thing. There's also, however, a feelings of inferiority. Inferiority. If you are what you do, when things don't go well for you, you feel crushed. There's um, on the, I think it's the, an ABC show, The Resident, takes place in a hospital, and this ballet dancer comes in and he's had a foot injury and he's pleading with the doctors to do whatever they can to fix it. And he says, because I've given up everything, there's nothing else, only the work, only the work. You can see right there that in his mind, if he can no longer dance, his life, his identity shatters before him. So feelings of superiority and inferiority. Second, excusing or even celebrating sin. This is a big one. Every cultural pressure comes along with aspects of it that we can celebrate and aspects of it that we've got to put through. Well, let's say that a little bit differently. The Christian must put their culturally endorsed aspects through the grid of the Scriptures, celebrate what can be celebrated, but call sin, sin. There is always going to be a pressure to downplay the things that are called sin in the scriptures, but are celebrated in your culture. And when somebody asks, hey, what do you think about X or Y or Z? To reason it away, to him and ha, when the Bible is really clear. Now, this can even be true of finding yourself in an environment. Say you find yourself in a corporate setting where... Blind eyes are turned to malpractice or to, you know, uh, leveraging people's ignorance to get their money out of their pockets and into your hands. It might be an environment like that. It might be in the place that you work, you know, say you're, I don't know, you get the point. Every single environment you find yourself in, there are going to be some things that are excused or even celebrated that the Bible calls sin. And the Christian can never kind of water down what the Scriptures call sin. Here's a third one. An inability to say no to the wrong thing. 
How do you know when you're rebuilding a self-made you? When you have an inability to say no to the wrong thing. Yes, that holds true in terms of sin. But it's also, it holds true in terms of the rhythms of your life. If you are what you do, then you're not going to be able to work and rest well. Because every opportunity is a building block for your identity. And how can you give that up? How can you say no to that? An inability to say no to the wrong thing is a mark of rebuilding a self-made you. Why are these so dangerous? Paul says in verse 21, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. He says if you rebuild a self-made you, you're basically nullifying the reason that Jesus came into the world. What is he talking about? Jesus came into the world to take the place of sinful human beings so that they might occupy his place. Some people call this the great exchange, that Jesus came into the world and he became sin for us. All of our self-made identities were poured upon him on the cross. And he died for them, not because he deserved to, because we deserved to. Now that might sound intense, but it goes all the way back to the garden when our first parents bought the lie that, hey, if you reject God, then you can be like God. Every human being since has built their identity off of the self rather than trusting God to give them their identity. And Christ came so that through faith in Christ, we might have a redeemed identity. But Paul would say, look, if you have received that and yet you go and now start to live as if that identity needs to be supplemented built onto, added onto, it's all for nothing. Because you're basically saying the identity that Christ has given me is insufficient. I need more. I need more. Paul says, no, no, no. We win the war for our identity when we refuse to build a self-made you. But rather, trust that the life you have in Jesus is enough. I love this scripture. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. What does Paul say Christians look to to figure out who they are? Jesus Christ. There's only one well. There's only one source. And it's the best possible source. Christ himself. And then look what he says. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Now this is really interesting. The Galatians received Christ, but then as they go on, they feel like they need to supplement their identity. Paul says, no, here's what you need to do. You live every day of your life in faith that the identity Christ has given you is sufficient. It is enough. The work is done. I think this shows us something really important. It is not the case that Christians have faith and and, and non-Christians don't have faith. Everybody is trusting something. Everybody is putting their faith in something to tell them who they are. The only question then becomes, what are you putting your faith in? Everybody's going to put put their faith in something to tell them who they are. For Christians, it's very clear. Christ Jesus tells me who I am. Here's why this is so powerful. Because Christ, the, the, the identity that comes from Christ is sufficient in ways that you can't even imagine. You remember I described to you the great exchange. The scriptures say, Christ became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, those things that are true about Christ now become true about you. And this is is one of the most powerful day-to-day things that you can believe. Here's what I mean. John 1 verse 12 says this. Well, let me, let, let, let me get at this point a little bit differently. In, in the show The West Wing, Lord John Marbury, the British ambassador to the United States, always introduces himself this way. Lord John Marbury, Earl of Croy, 
Marquess of Needham and Dolby, Baronet of Brycey, Ambassador from the United Kingdom. That's how he introduces himself. And the idea is he's pointing back to his royal lineage to show how much clout his identity has. If you believe in Jesus, here's what's true about you. John 1 verse 12. To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Do you know who's more royal than the Marquess of Needham and Dolby, the Baronet of Brycey? God. (laughs) King of the universe. And yet there's such a distinct pressure to accrue pedigree so that you can feel worthwhile. If you believe in Jesus, you are royal. You are a son and daughter of the king. Paul would say, live by faith in that gospel truth, day by day. That needs no supplementing, no add-ons, no additions or renovations. It is powerful. Here's another one. Ephesians 1 verse 8. Having the eyes, this is Paul praying for the Ephesians. He says, I want you to have the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. The riches of his glorious inheritance. Do you know what feels like a really nice way to form your identity when you have a giant pile of money that you can point to and say, and say that's mine. You know what that says about me? Now, it might not be a pile of money. It might be an apartment that is amazing, you know, a home that's extraordinary. You live in the right neighborhood, go to the right schools. Nothing wrong with those, but if those are the source of your identity, you're losing the war. Look, no, no matter how much money you have in the bank, if you believe in Jesus, you are an heir to the riches, his glory, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. If you believe in Jesus, Do you realize that every single day of your life, there is a a wealth and a kingdom beyond your imagination that is your inheritance? You don't need to accrue a bunch of wealth to tell people who you are. You are rich beyond your wildest, wildest dreams. Live by faith in the Son of God. Trust that the life you have in Jesus is enough. Here's a third one. Psalm 8, verse 3 through 4, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? I love that psalm. You realize that you are worthwhile? Not because of what you do, not because of what you feel, not because of the environment or the nation you grew up in or the culture that is so you know, revered around the world, because God... Because God, who created the heavens and the earth and, oh yeah, everything, has made you in his image. And he looks at you and he says, worthwhile, matters, in my image. Look at Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Look, Paul says if I, that I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. The word righteousness is one of these beautiful, multifaceted biblical words. Um, But for our purposes, Dr. Tim Keller has a great way to describe righteousness. He says, it's anything you look to to know that you're okay. Anything you look to to know that you're okay. In Christ, your okayness, it's settled. It's done. You are righteous in Christ. If your righteousness comes from what you do then when what you do is unsuccessful, you're going to be crushed. Here's the beautiful thing about having your identity grounded in Christ. When things go successfully in your endeavors or unsuccessfully, you're all right. You're okay with God. You have a standing with God that is good. You are royal. You are rich. You are worthwhile. You are all right. How then do we put this into practice? I want to give you three, uh, four, four things here. First, 
Identify your wells. I talked about how we tap wells to figure out who we are. Look, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're having faith in something to tell you who you are. If you are a follower of Jesus, your unseen enemies are going to try and convince you to go back to those wells time and time again to tell you who you are. John D. Ro- uh, John D. Rockefeller said, said this, One more million dollars and I'll feel I'm okay. What is that thing in your life that the enemy constantly wants to tell you you need in order to be okay? If, if you can just get this, if you can just experience this, if you can just finally attain to this, all of us are going to have one or other things that are a strong pull, a well that has a strong tide. I know wells don't have tides, but you get the image. Identify your wells. Second, Confess what is true about Christ. Out loud, out of your mouth. And here's why. If Christ is the foundation, the basis of your identity, the more that your understanding of and worship of Christ grows, the more solid your identity will feel. You know, it's like, as you point to Christ, the larger He looms in your view, the more solid you feel because He says who you are. Confess what is true about Christ. In the more, and this holds true for all times of the day. And I think this is especially true when you feel a demonic attack to need other things to tell you who you are. In those moments, confess what is true about Christ. Confess what is true about Christ. Third, confess what is true about you. There are extraordinary things that this Bible says about you, and sometimes we just don't believe them. We don't, you know, our hearts are slow to believe them. And what is a really powerful way to drive them down into the recesses of your heart is to confess them out loud. You're like, out loud? Yes. Out loud. You'll sound like a crazy person. Who cares? Pop in your AirPods, walk on the sidewalk, people will think you're just talking on the phone. You can pray, confessing Scripture out loud. Confess what is true about you. You know, I said earlier, you are royal. You can say about yourself, I am royal. You are rich. You can say, I am rich. You are worthwhile. You can say, I am worthwhile. And on the days when you don't feel worthwhile, it's important to confess it. You are all right. You are righteous in Christ. You can say, I am okay. I am all right. And then fourth, reject the pressure to rebuild. This is how you fight. Day by day, you will experience pressure from your unseen enemies, cultural pressure to add things to your identity in Christ. And you simply say, no. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. The way you fight is to trust. And I love this. The, the gospel is so powerful because your salvation is by sheer grace. It's not the work you do. You you fight to hold faith in something that has already been accomplished. And this for Paul is the power he needs to hold on to his identity. What does he say? The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. And then listen to these words. Let them minister to your heart. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Who loved me And gave himself for me. The reason you can know that Christ is the one you can point to to tell you who you are. Is because he loved you and has given his life for you. There's no more profound and history altering proclamation about God's valuation of human beings. But that he would send his son To make the great exchange and stand in their place on the cross. If ever you doubt the efficacy of the identity that you can have in Christ. Say it along with Paul. He loved me and he gave himself for me. If you have never put your faith in Jesus. You're trusting something else. But the invitation this morning is to believe in the gospel. And find your identity in Christ. If you want to. Pray that prayer, and if you want to put your faith in Christ, come talk to me afterwards. Talk to the friend who invited you. We'd love to help walk you through that. 
If you are a Christian in here, maybe you find yourself in a place where you realize you've been supplementing your identity. There are things that have had a strong pull and a tug and pressure on you to ground your identity in there. Paul would summon you to, to fight, to fight, to tear down and not to rebuild, to go back to the source of what says who you are. It is Christ who loved you and gave himself for you. As we come to the bread and the cup this morning, that's what we remember. This is the body and the blood of Christ who has loved us and has given his life for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good news that Jesus Christ stepped out of the glory of heaven to take our place, to make the great exchange. And now we have been made righteous because of his substitution. God, we didn't deserve that. God, we've all tried to create self made identities, we've all fallen short of your glory. So we thank you for the the loving sacrifice of our Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room. I pray that you would shine a spotlight on the schemes and the tactics of their unseen enemies to get them away from their true identity in Christ and give them the power of your spirit with which they can fight and win this war for their identity. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.